Howdy YouTube and welcome to this episode of The Gunman. So this video here is part 3 on the paintwork of this HQ Monaro. We're doing a spot repair on the lower door and lower quarter panel. The previous two videos went through the prep, colour matching and masking stage. Now we've got it in the booth and we're ready to give it a tack rag down and get some paint onto it. I can't give you guys the paint code for this one, but it's just a fine metallic silver. Those who saw part one will know that I actually did a bit of a bench mix myself and I just formulated, mixed and matched my own colour for this one. So now we've got all the prep work done, we're tack rag down, we're ready to start to get some paint on. So what I'm using first up here is some Triple 2S. It's a great product. It's actually mainly used as an adhesion promoter. It's something that I used years ago a lot and a lot of it um, now I'm using solvent we've got a bit of a risk of shrink back and fry ups and stuff like that this actually acts as a good barrier to sort of seal down some of that old paint that we've cut through underneath there especially on the back edge of that quarter panel you may notice that I didn't even prime the lower section where I did a couple of uh, little uh, repairs and just more uh, stone chips and stuff that I fixed I um, just put the fine filler in and sprayed this stuff straight over it. I'm actually going over the entire door. I'm actually using this stuff here also as a blending aid. So I'm not even using the 599 on the base coat blender, which you may uh, see me use in some of my other videos. So I'm, I'm trusting this stuff to fill those scratches in uh, so that it's going to enable me to blend my silver metallic straight into that. Once I got that down, I decided to give it five minutes to flash off. Depending on the job, I might sort of jump the gun on it and just give it, you know, a minute minute or two at 30 degrees or 27 degrees whatever the booth is set to I think it's at around 27 um, but yeah for a job like this where the main purpose is to help seal that paint down giving it that little bit longer will be advantageous so next up straight on to our base coat stage I'm using my GTI Pro with the 1.3 mil on it and I'm actually still running the TE10 air cap I ended up finding this is the best cap for spraying my waterborne base coats and it's still been doing quite well for my solvent based base coats as well. Just take note of the way that I'm spraying uh, anywhere that's close to that masking line up the top there. I was just sort of angling the gun uh, downwards so that I'm not getting too much of a build up on that masking edge that you may have uh, seen me do in episode two where I did that false edge masking across the side. Um, in between coats you may notice me just blowing the air over it. Again, that's something that the paint reps will probably not tell you to do, but if you can do it with water, why can't you do it with solvent? Yes, they say that you can possibly trap the solvents in there, I really don't think it's a big deal or an issue at all. Uh, if anything, it's actually going to work in your favour to stop any chances of shrink back because the longer that those st solvents are going to be staying wet on the panel, the more chance of having any shrink back. So yeah, I've got no issues whatsoever with blowing a little bit of air lightly over the panel to help dry that base coat. As I say, you can do it with water. Why can't you do it with solvent? Why would it be more likely to trap anything in there than what it would be with water? You can also do the same thing with water. You can trap the uh, water inside a waterborne job. So yeah, you can uh, blow it down, think it's dry. It looks dry and it has skinned over the top, but it's sort of like a puddle where the top layer is dry. Underneath, it's just this big pool of water. It's actually more likely to happen with your waterborne paints. Um, yeah, look, no one's gonna tell you other than the government that this is a recommended method. But trust me, it does work. I don't get dieback uh, with doing this method. Uh, so this is my last coat of uh, base coat. You can see I'm just doing a nice blend. It, because it's a solvent, it's laying down easy. I don't have to do these control coats and tech coats and whatever, all this fancy stuff. And the, the metallic isn't just floating all the way down the door. Um, yeah, I, I think that at this point in time, I'm glad to be back on solvent. Yes, as I've already said, there are definite advantages of water. But in this shop, I think we're best off using solvent. I would not recommend my boss going over to water. He hasn't got much to gain by moving over to water. He's probably got more to lose, to be honest. He's got the learning curve of teaching the other two or three guys that are working with us in the paint shop. Uh, you've also got the extra costs of it. And is the finish that much better that it warrants the extra price? Personally, I don't really think so. When it gets to the point where the insurance companies are refusing to use repairers that don't use the waterborne products, yep, maybe go that way. Uh, when it gets to the point when the waterborne paints are cheaper than solvents, okay, maybe go that way. But for now, I wouldn't recommend him moving over. Plus, he's an old school painter anyway. He's been working at this shop for plus 30 years. So he's only ever worked at this shop. He's worked his way right up. This paint shop was his. 
and now he's ended up buying the entire business. He's a partner in business with the uh, other panel bearer who also did his apprenticeship at this shop. So you really feel like you're part of a family, like a real close knit uh, group of employees and bosses at this shop. And I'm uh, really happy to just get in there and make them as much money as possible. So you might have noticed there was a little bit of a uh, mottle around that blend area. So I'm just dusting a couple of coats on, seeing if it's uh, laying down nice couple of extra coats and it seemed to blend out quite nicely and lay down with uh, no model. I'm expecting a few people to say, oh, you shouldn't be cutting that off at the lines. No, you're going to get a color difference. You're going to get a bit of a line there. But I think there's the other side of it that there's probably going to be more people that would uh, have a bit more to gain and like to know how to do this kind of thing than there is going to be hating on me. So. I don't really care about that too much, you know, hate on me all you like, but I think it's a good skill to have to be able to do this kind of repair. As soon as this rolled out the booth, my boss looked at it, it was in direct sunlight, he had a customer with him, and I could just tell just by looking at uh, the look on his face that he was impressed, you know, and you do get brownie points with this boss uh, if you can do these sort of old school type spot repairs, burn-ins and stuff like that. So I'm happy to do this kind of thing and it is a little bit of a challenge sometimes. They ask you to do a job a specific way and you're like, uh, I'd rather just do it this way, you know. Uh, you know, But to do this job uh, without cutting it off at these lines, you would be either doing a burn-in or a, a piss-out, we call it over here in Australia, on the uh, quarter panel or you would be painting the entire roof the other quarter panel and it just turns into a massive job. I think the owner actually specifically said he doesn't want this job to get any bigger than is necessary. I think the boss also tries to keep the cost down for some of the customers without uh, compromising the quality of the job as well. So you've probably noticed that I've got my first coat of clear down, GDI Pro Light TE20 with 1.3 mil air cap, four turns out on the fluid, full fan and two bar. Recently had a guy tell me on Instagram that he's actually a convert from his SATA jets and he now prefers his GTI Pro Light. I think he said he was running the T110 air cap and he goes, yeah, it's taken the top spot in my uh, spray gun collection. As most of you guys would probably already know, this gun did take out number one in my top 10 spray guns video that I did around six months ago. So there's many reasons for that. It's well priced, it's not overpriced. I've been informed recently that on some other separate forums other than the gunman, some people call me a DeVilbus advertisement. And look, at the end of the day, I really don't care what you guys buy or where you guys buy it from. I'm more out there to actually help people and tell you my opinion. I personally have used DeVilbus for a long time and I do recommend them to people, whether or not it was my apprentice at work, giving him my honest opinion on what I think he should buy for a good quality gun that's reasonably priced and that performs well, it's versatile. I mean, yeah, I could go on about it, but um, yeah, if that's the way I, I looked at it, if that's all they can come up with uh, to have a bit of a dig at me, well, well that's not really that bad, you know? Uh, not really a big deal. But yeah, back onto working for a good boss, it really makes a difference to the morale of the workshop and I found myself working for this big uh, company and they're just ruthless. You're literally, you're just another number. I had to get out of there. I've had a few people say, oh, why do you keep moving around? You know, well, there's definitely obviously a few reasons, but um, yeah, I, I'm going to be here for a long time. I can imagine I've got my girlfriend coming over from Thailand soon, hopefully sooner rather than later. But um, yeah, working for those big companies, I personally recommend nobody does it. And if everyone walks out of their big shops, well then they ain't gonna have shops for much longer. I know it's obviously easier said than done and not everyone is in the position where they can just walk out on their job. They've got uh, commitments, mortgages, families to feed and all that kind of thing. But yeah, if you do find yourself working for one of those big companies, I don't know. It would go against my morales as an employee or as a my work ethics to tell you not to put in a good day's work. So I kind of really couldn't say that. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd just say, you know, run those guys out of the business and out of the trade. I don't think they have really good names anyway. I've seen them actually turn reputable businesses into just money-making factories, companies that used to be really well known for pumping out good quality work 
and looking after their employees just uh, yeah turn it into a place where everybody hates working there and it's sad to see they started to bring in this uh, clock on clock off barcode system where there's someone sitting in their big head office and watching every single minute if you take too long on a job they will call up your manager and get him to come down and see what you're doing for that exact minute um, and that's just bullshit for me I would sooner work for a boss like this not looking over my shoulder every day work my absolute ass off, get more work done and make him money. Yes, I do have to write out a timesheet, so he does know what I do, but um, it's sort of in a t completely different manner, you know. Anyway, enough rambling on talking shop, let's continue on with the job. So you've noticed I've finished my second coat of clear coat, I did my fade out, that was a little bit of AK-350, I mixed that into the gun, just poured it straight into the gun as you probably noticed and faded out those couple of edges. We'll get the buff onto that uh, after the long weekend and I've just peeled off that uh, false edge masking or the soft edge masking that I put up the top there. It turns out that there was a very slight little bit of bridging, nothing major. I was able to just give it a quick scuff back with a little bit of 2000 grit, get the buff back onto it and uh, remove that edge. And I did that for the rest of that line as well. There's a, a, there was a soft bit of overspray up there, but the buff was able to bring that off. Um, I actually noticed down the bottom there, there was a little bit of a sag or a run call it what you will so we left it over the weekend this is my tungsten block i've actually had this thing for well over 10 years now and it's still going strong i don't let people use it i don't like people using my stuff around the workshop if they're careful with it depending on what it is i will let them use it and i give them strict orders to put it back but i say that because uh at this workshop they've got their own tungsten and i was out there doing some polishing one day didn't have my tungsten on me so i decided to borrow the workshop's one i went to use it and it was just scratching the shit out of my panel because it had obviously been dropped numerous times and it's just got these bird over edges so it's ended up doing more harm than good and I would have just been better off blocking it down. I did end up having a little bit of a recording issue. Again I thought I was recording for a little bit more of the footage there but um, it cut out for some reason. I looked at the camera and it was off so I'm pretty sure I didn't turn it off halfway through doing that but um, I'm not, I wasn't able to show you the finishing of doing that run down the bottom there. But um, yeah, up, this is that piece up the top of that line where it just, the clear coat did just start to bridge. Just gave it a little scuff back just by hand and got the buff onto it. Um, when using the buff, I like to, especially on areas like this where you could possibly cut through, you can sort of hear me just feathering that trigger on, so just uh, not going flat out. Yeah, if you've got a uh, variable speed buff, then just sit it on a low RPM. But these old roots have only really got one speed, flat out or not at all. They're probably some of the best buffs you'll get, and yeah, they just keep going and going and going. You replace the brushes in them every now and then, and they just don't break. You can throw them around, drop them on the ground. I've seen people, yeah, just kicking them around on the floors, and they just keep, seem to keep going and going. Um, and there we've got a little bit of silica and I thought I was just about done and I was getting my eye down the side of the panel and I found a couple of spots of silica and those who have watched this video set right from the beginning will remember that this car, yes it's a car lover's car so uh, they are quite prone to using some cleaning products that contain silica and I did actually wax and grease remover this car probably about four times but I still ended up with a little bit of silica or fish eyes in the clear coat, it was only a couple so not a big deal uh, I just did decide to use just standard 2k clear I put a little bit of uh, rocket which is like the racing additive in there uh, you can use super glue I wouldn't recommend it but if you're in a real hurry and you haven't got time for two pack to dry you can put super glue in there but it's really just to get out of jail free if you ever can I do recommend using the proper clear using the heat lights and uh, yeah it should cure within 20 30 minutes or even just the heat gun or something like that if you do get some silicon holes so that's about it for this video guys hope you have enjoyed watching this video set there's a couple of videos here that you may also be interested in sort of more in-depth restoration videos now you've seen this video get out there and paint some shit thanks for watching and this has been another government production goodbye